Khaled, our assistant uh, director general, who is running the show this evening. Thank you both to Josh and to Michal. Um, I am a fan of murder mysteries. Um, I have read the complete works of Sherlock Holmes twice. I have read Martha Grimes twice. I'm in the middle of reading Sue Grafton the second time. And therefore, my talk this evening is about a mystery. And the mystery is whatever happened to the Ten Commandments. Uh, if the Ten Commandments are so important to Judaism, and we're going to read them on Shavuot in the morning, why don't we recite them every day? Now, that is my question. And a number of years ago, I addressed that question in an article, which appeared in my book, Inside Israel, Volume 2, published by Schechter. And it's also on the Schechter website. And this evening, we're going to uh, study the Hebrew sources, which are behind my article. And uh, in the chat, you will find both uh, a PDF of the article and a link to the article on the Schechter website. But rather than read the English summary, I would like to study with you uh, the Hebrew sources. Um, so the Torah reading for Shavuot is the Ten Commandments. This is based on the opinion of one of the Tanaim, one of the rabbis of the Mishnah. Uh, and that's found in three places in rabbinic literature, in the Tosefta, in the Rishami, and in the Babylonian Talmud. And this is because the rabbis of the Talmud believed that the Torah was given on Mount Sinai on the holiday of Shavuot. And that's found in a famous passage in the Tractate of Shabbat. Um, and therefore, it's surprising that we only read the Ten Commandments in public on Shavuot. And as part of the weekly portions of Yitro, Exodus chapter 20. And later on in Vayet Hanan, Deuteronomy chapter 5, as you know, there are two versions of the Ten Commandments in the Torah. Uh, and the Bible itself considered the Ten Commandments extremely important to the covenant between God and the Jewish people. Uh, for example, the Ten Commandments are quoted or paraphrased in three places in the book of Psalms by the prophet Hosea and by the prophet Jeremiah. And if we move down in time to the time of Philo of Alexandria, no, he is not the person who invented Philo Do. Rather, Philo of Alexandria was a very famous uh, Alexandrian Jewish thinker in the first century. Uh, he considered the Ten Commandments the essence of the entire Torah, which elaborates uh, in detail what the Ten Commandments say in condensed form. And interestingly enough, the same idea appears in the Talmud Yerushalmi in two places. The Yerushalmi says, Ma hayamaze ben gal gadol le gal gadol galim ketanim, kach ben kol diber vediber diktukeha veototeha shel Torah. Just as it sees there are huge waves with a host of little waves between them, so are there Ten Commandments with a host of refinements and particular commandments of the, of the Torah between them. It's as if the Ten Commandments is the condensation of the entire Torah, uh, and the rest is commentary or elaboration on the Ten Commandments, so says Philo, and so says the Talmud Yerusham. Uh, 500 years later, the famous Jewish philosopher Rav Sajigaon who died in Babylon in the year 942, he wrote a type of liturgical poem which are called Azharot. Now for Ashkenazic Jews, that word doesn't mean much of anything. If you're a Sephardic Jew or a Jew from Oriental lands, you know what Azharot are. Azharot are special piyutim, uh, which were composed for the holiday of Shavuot, which contain all 613 commandments, and they are divided according to headings of the Ten Commandments. And if you go into a Sephardic synagogue in Jerusalem or throughout the state of Israel on the holiday of Shavuot, at some point during Shavuot, you will see people sitting and reciting the Azharot, which were invented by Rav Saji Gaon in the 10th century. Um, and two more uh, emphases of this phenomenon of the importance of the Ten Commandments. Uh, for example, we have in Bamid Barabbah, uh, which was edited in Provence uh, in the 12th century. Uh, it says there, Taryag mitzvot kilulot or bilulot bahen, vechenat motze taryag otiot yesh min anochi adasher lereacha keneged taryag mitzvot, vesheva yeterot keneged shivat yemei breshit. This medieval midrash says that there are 620 letters in the Ten Commandments. 
you can go after the classes are over, you can take a Tanakh and count them. 620 letters in the Ten Commandments. Uh, 613 letters refer to the 613 commandments and the other seven refer to the seven days of creation. This comes to teach you that the entire world was created for the sake of the Torah. Uh, and finally, uh, okay, that's enough. So I think I made my point that the Ten Commandments are extremely important uh, in Jewish uh, tradition. And therefore the simple question is, why don't we read the Ten Commandments every day just as we read the Shema, uh, three passages from uh, the Torah, Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 11, Numbers chapter 15, and just as we read As Yeshir, the Song at the Sea, which is taken from Exodus chapter 15. Now, the answer to this question, and now I'm going to pull up the source sheet, I hope. As I said, I hope. I don't see it. Can you put it up? Uh... Do you want me to share it? Yeah, please share it, Michal. Okay. It's a story sheet we sent this morning. Yep. Okay. Can you see it? And yeah, if you can make it a little, uh, blow it up a bit. We're going to start with source number one on the right. Excellent. Okay. So we'll begin with the second temple period. And we now know that the Jews did indeed recite the Ten Commandments every morning during the second temple period. And we have a number of proofs of that assertion. The first is text number one in front of you, uh, which is has a very funny name in Hebrew. It's called Papyrus Nash, the Nash Papyrus. Nash was not a very a famous rabbi. Rabbi, rather, W. L. Nash was the secretary of the Society of Biblical Archaeology in England, and he purchased this sheet of papyrus from an Egyptian antiquities dealer in 1903. Uh, and in a minute, we're going to look at a picture of the Nash papyrus. Um, so this is the Nash papyrus written out. And for those of you who know Hebrew, it starts out, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, Asher Otsitich HaMeretz Yisrael, I am the Lord your God, it took you out of the land of Egypt. Sounds familiar. Lines 1 through uh, 21 are the Ten Commandments, and the scholars argue, is this the version from Exodus? Is this a version for Deuteronomy? Or is this a combined version of both of them? But then, all of a sudden, it segues, uh, verses 22, or lines 22 and 23, Ve'ela ha'chukim ha'mishpatim asher tziva Moshe b'nei Yisrael b'midbar, b'tzeta me'eretz misrayim, and these are the laws and the statutes which Moses commanded the children of Israel in the desert, when they left Egypt, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. In other words, what you have in front of you here is the Ten Commandments, either from Deuteronomy or Exodus or both of them, followed by the beginning of the Shema with an intermediate uh, verse, which is found in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Torah from 2200 years ago. In other words, uh, most scholars think that this was a liturgical text uh, from 150 BCE, before the Common Era, which Mr. Nash purchased in, in 1903. And Michal, if you could just scroll down to the next page, uh, you'll see here a Xerox from the Encyclopedia Judaica of the Nash Papyrus, just a little bit further. This is what the papyrus actually looks like. In other words, a uh, Scholars simply copied out what is written here on this small piece of papyrus. Uh, this is the Nash papyrus from uh, 2,150 years ago, purchased by Nash in 1903 from an Egyptian antiquities dealer. If you could skip back, uh, Michal, please, to the first page. Um, and the we'll now skip to source number two, which is in larger print. Whoop. There we go. And this is the Mishnah and the Tractate of Tamid. And the Tractate of Tamid is one of the oldest tractates in the Mishnah. It, it describes what was done Tamid. Uh, every day, uh, the Korban Tamid, the uh, standard sacrifice morning and evening in the temple, 
And it's basically describing the daily worship in the temple. Remember, this is a time when they're still offering sacrifices every day in the temple. But nonetheless, early in the morning, this is what the priests would do. Amar laem the um, one of the priestly functionaries who was called a who had a certain function in the temple, he would say to the other priests, Baruchu bracha achat, a bless one blessing, which according to the Talmud was the blessing of Ava Raba, Vehen Berechu, and they blessed, Karu, and then they would read the following, Aseret Advarim, the Ten Commandments, Shema, first paragraph of the Shema, Vayayim Shamoa, the second paragraph of the Shema, Vayomer, the third paragraph of the Shema, and then Berechu et Ha'am Shalosh Brachot, and then they would uh, bless the people three blessings. The first is Emet V'yatsiv, which we still recite after the Shema in the morning. Va'avoda, uh, one of the blessings of the Amida. And Birkat Kuanim, the priestly blessing. We won't go, go into the argument of how they recited that in the temple. Ube Shabbat Mosifim Bracha Achat Mishmar Yotze. And on Shabbat, they would add one additional Bracha for the people finishing their temple duty who were going off duty. Uh, but the what this Mishnah clearly says is that before the year 70, before the destruction of the second temple, every morning in the temple, the, the Kohanim, the priests, would recite Aseret Advarim, followed by the three paragraphs of the Shema. So on the one hand, we have the Nash Papyrus from Egypt, which shows that Jews recited the Ten Commandments and the Shema apparently every day. And we have the Mishnah in Tamid. Mode. We have the Mishnah in Tamid, which explicitly says that the priests in the temple recited the Ten Commandments and the three paragraphs of the Shema every morning. So, as they say in Aramaic, Hadrat Kushya the question returns. We return to our question: whatever happened to the Ten Commandments? And now we look at source number three. If you could just raise the screen a little bit, uh, Michal. Source number three is taken. No, no, down, down. Bip, bip, bip. There, Todaraba. Source number three is taken from the Talmud Yerushalmi, Tractate of Brachot. I Xerox this from the Vilna edition. And, and I'm interested in the second section that I put in brackets. The Rab Matana Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman Tarvayun Amre. Rab Matana, a second or fourth generation Babylonian Amara, Amora. And Shmua Bar Nachman, a third generation Amora. In other words, we're talking about the third century of the Common Era. The two of them say, Bidin haya shiyu korin aseret adibot v'choyom. Logic would dictate that we read aseret adibot, the Ten Commandments, every day. Umipnei ma'ein korin otan. And why do we not read them every day? Mipnei ta'anot haminin. Because of the claims of the heretics, because of the claims of the heretics who claim that only the Ten Commandments were given um, to Moses at Mount Sinai. Now, who exactly are these heretics? Uh, the answer is nobody knows. Um, the um, Professor Orbach, famous professor of Talmud, winner of the Israel Prize, I had the pleasure of knowing him. He died about 30 years ago. Professor Orbach published an entire article about the liturgical use of the Ten Commandments. And most of his article is devoted to the question is, who are these minim? Are they early Christians? Are they Gnostics? Are they some other sect that existed uh, at this period of time? Um, and we'll get back to that question in a moment. Let's first look at the Babli version, the Talmud Babli version of this. Go to source number four, please, Michal. Go down a bit. No, down, down. Down, down, down. Okay, I guess, sorry, it must be on the upper left corner. So go to the left at the top. Okay, I'll just move everybody's picture over to the side. Can you see it? Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Tam Talmud Babli, Babylonian Talmud, Brachot 12a. And this, the Talmud here quotes the Mishnah we studied a few minutes ago. It quotes the Mishnah from Tamid that the priests every morning would recite the Ten Commandments, the three paragraphs of the Shema, etc., etc. Amar Abiyud Amar Shmuel. 
Rabbi Yudah Amar Shmuel, Rabbi Yudah, second generation Amora in Babylon, Shmuel, the first generation Amora. Av Pagvulim Bikshu Likro, should say Likrot. Even outside of the temple or outside of Jerusalem, they wanted to read uh, these passages, including the Ten Commandments. Ela Shekvar Bitlum Mipne Taromat Aminim, but they did away with them because of the um, murmurings or the claims of the heretics. Um, Tanya Nami Hachi, we learn the same thing in a a teaching of the Tanaim, the rabbis of the Mishnah, Rabbi Natan Omer, Bagvulin Bikshuli Krotken. Outside of Jerusalem, they wanted to read the Ten Commandments. El Shekvar Bitlum Ipnei Taromat Aminim. They did away with them because of the murmurings of the heretics. Rabbi Barba Chana Savar Mikbi'inu Besura. And now we're switching back to Babylon. Rabbi Barbar Khanna, third generation Amora in the town, famous city of Surah in Babylon. He wanted to fix the Ten Commandments in the liturgy. Amar le Rav Chista, another third generation Babylonian Amora. Kvar bitlum ipnei taromad aminim. This was already done away with because of the claims of the heretics. And now we jump forward another two generations. Amemar savar le mikbuni b'neharda. Amemar, fifth generation Babylonian Amorah, wanted to fix the Ten Commandments and the liturgy in the Harda, another famous Jewish city. Amar le Ravashi, Rabit Lum, Ipnei Taromat Aminim. Ravashi in the sixth generation says, sorry, this was already done away with because of the Minim, the heretics. So now we return to our question of Professor Orbach. Who exactly are these heretics? Michal, if you could move down just a tiny bit, source five, Yofi. Okay. And I'm sorry, in the Xerox, this got cut off a bit at the end of the line. And Professor Orbach quotes here a medieval Midrash, which is apparently, even though it was edited in France in the 13th century, Yalkut Shimoni is apparently a much older tradition. And this is talking about the rebellion of Korach against Moses. And as you may know, in the Midrashim about the rebellion of Korach against Moses, they always put into the mouths of Korach all sorts of uh, Talmudic uh, claims or discussions. And they gathered against Moses and Aaron. They gathered together communities. Uh, I'm going to skip to the third or fourth line. Why do you say you're holy? At Mount Sinai, we were all there. We were all there. And the only thing that God gave us at Mount Sinai is the Ten Commandments. So say Korach and his friends. Velo sham chala, there is no mitzvah of hafrashat chala, of separating the dough for the priests. Velo sham truma o masrot, there are no truma and masrot for the priests or the Levites. Velo sham tzitzit, there is no mitzvah of tzitzit. Ela me'atzmecha ata omer ken. In other words, this midrash puts into the mouth of Korach and his friends a claim against Moshe Rabbeinu, against Moses and Aaron. The only thing that God gave us at Mount Sinai was the Ten Commandments. The rest of the commandments you guys made up. We don't have to observe them. Now, what does Professor Orbach suggest? Professor Orbach suggests that this Midrash reflects Jews in Babylon, in the Talmudic period, who are making these claims against the rabbis. And who are saying, we don't have to observe all the mitzvot. We only have to observe the Ten Commandments. And therefore, all of these Babylonian Amoraim that we just quoted in Brachot, Folio 12a, they are reacting to these murmurings, to these complaints of Jews in their day. And they say, we did away with the daily recitation of the Ten Commandments because of the complaints, the murmurings of the minim of the heretics. In other words, Orbach, as opposed to many other scholars, does not think that these are early Christians or some other sect. He thinks that these are Jews in Babylon, opposed to observing many of the mitzvot and saying only the Ten Commandments are important. And therefore, uh, the rabbis in Babylon reacted by saying, uh, we're, therefore, we are no longer going to recite the Ten Commandments on a daily basis. Uh, interestingly enough, and this is number six, number six is not missing because I left it out on, uh, by accident. I left it out on purpose. Number six is a bunch of sources that were discovered in the Cairo Geniza. Uh, and Professor Jacob Mann, 
who was one of the early scholars who dealt with the um, chirogeniza. Um, he discovered uh, sources of daily prayers recited by Jews in Fostat uh, in medieval uh, Cairo. Uh, and in the, some of the um, Geniza fragments that he found, I'll read you one of his sentences. In the Palestinian syn synagogue at Fustat, the 10 commandments were recited daily. In other words, in addition to Az Yashir, the Exodus chapter 15, which we recite until now every day in the morning service, in those liturgical fragments from the Cairo Geniza, in the Palestinian synagogue, the synagogue uh, for, the, for the Jews of Eretz Israel, they were still reciting Aserat Adibrot, the 10 commandments, in the early medieval period in Cairo, among the uh, Jews of Eretz Israel, the Palestinian synagogue found in Cairo, as opposed to the Babylonian Jews who did not recite the 10 commandments. So despite all of the opposition we have seen until now to reciting the 10 commandments every day, uh, it managed to survive in the liturgy, at least among the Jews, the um, synagogue of the Jews of Eretz Israel in uh, Cairo. And now we skip to medieval Barcelona, source number seven. Uh, and by coincidence, I taught this responsum uh, this past week in my one of my responsa courses here at the Schechter Institute for rabbinical and MA students. Um, and this is a very interesting responsum of the Rashba, Rabbi Shlomo Ben Aderet, or Adret, who died in Barcelona around the year 1310. He was one of the most prolific respondents in Jewish history. Uh, his responsa on my shelf behind me uh, take up eight volumes. And in the printed editions, we have 3,373 responsa of the Rashba of Rabbi Shlomo Ben Aderet. And this responsum appears in part three, responsum number 289. And he was asked a very simple question by a Jew or a rabbi living in Spain. And they asked him as follows in source number seven. Od Sha'alta, you also asked, can we recite the Ten Commandments in the morning service in the synagogue? Because there are people who want to do this in public every day. The question is, is this proper to do or not? And in this case, the Rashba didn't have to work very hard. He didn't have to look through a hundred Talmudic sources. He simply quotes the passage from the tractate of Brachot that we studied a few minutes ago. Tshuva, asur la'asot ken, this is forbidden. Ve'af al pi she'shaninu b'masecha tamid, even though we learned in the Mishnah and Tamid, which was source number uh, two above. Amar lehem ha'memune, that the memune said to the priests. And then he quotes the Mishnah and Tamid, that you recite the Ten Commandments and the paragraphs of the Shema. He goes on to quote, this was already done away with because of the murmurings of the heretics. As we have seen in the first chapter of Brachot. And then he quotes the Talmudic passage that we studied a moment ago, which was source number uh, four. Um, he quotes Rabbi Yehud in the name of Shmuel. And he quotes Rabbi Natan. And he quotes Rabbi Barachana. And he quotes Ravashi, and then there's a sentence missing in the middle where he quotes Amemar. In other words, he simply quotes the Talmudic passage from Brachod. He says, I understand your desire to recite the Ten Commandments. Indeed, in the Second Temple period, they did recite the Ten Commandments every day. But Malasod, what can we do? Far bitlua bipnei They have already done away with the daily recitation of the Ten Commandments because of the murmuring of the heretics. Now, I could simply stop here and say to you, so we see that the Ten Commandments were removed from our liturgy. However, as you know, Jews have a way of getting around uh, every type of prohibition under the sun. And now we're going to look at sources eight and nine, where some rabbis very cleverly got around the prohibition. And they said, it's true. You're not allowed to recite the Ten Commandments in public because of the murmurings of the heretics. But that does not stop you from reciting the Ten Commandments every day in private. So we'll look first at source number uh, nine. Uh, we'll go in chronological order. 
source number nine is the Shulchan Aruch, Rabbi Yosef Karo, written in Sfat, in Safed, in the middle of the 16th century. And you'll notice this is the very first paragraph of the Shulchan Aruch, which is a very large book, takes up some 10 volumes. Very first paragraph of the Shulchan Aruch, uh, paragraph one, subparagraph five. Tov Lomar, Parshat Ha'akeda, Uparshat Haman, Baseret Adivrot, Uparshat Ola, Uminha Ushlami, Vachatat Basha. He says that every morning it is good to recite uh, these sections of the Torah, the story of the Akedah, the story of the man, the manna, the Ten Commandments, and then uh, some paragraphs relating to specific sacrifices taken from the book of Vayikra, the book of Leviticus. In other words, what is the what is the Shulchan Aruch saying? And the Ramah, Rabbi Moshe Isulis, says this in his comment, which is in Rashi script, right below that. As you may know, the Shulchan Aruch has Rabbi Yosef Karo, followed always by the comments of Rabbi Moshe Isulis in Krakow. Rabbi Moshe Isulis died in Krakow in the year 1571, and this appeared right around the time when he died. Specifically, for individuals, it's permissible to recite the Ten Commandments. But it is forbidden to recite them in public. Parentheses, see the response of the Rashba, paragraph 184. In other words, right after Rabbi Yosef Karo says you can recite or you should recite the Ten Commandments every morning, the Ramah immediately chimes in and says, Yes, but not in public, only in private. And last but not least, the Marshal, Rabbi Shlomo Luria, source number eight, very famous rabbi, also lived in Poland, uh, died around the year um, 1570, contemporary of the Ramah. And he's describing here in his response of paragraph 64, his daily routine. Shuv anino heglo mara serata di brot korem baruch shamar. It is my custom to recite the Ten Commandments before Baruch Shamar, Bekoram, aloud, even though, and it should say the Rashba, Rabbi Shlomo ben Aderet, wrote in his responsa to forbid this, and he quotes the tractate of Rachot, davka yotzer. It seems that his opposition was to put it next to the Shema, avala omra b'chol boker, but to say it every morning in honor of the Torah, v'lichvod Hashem and in honor of God, the creator, that the Ten Commandments were uh, carved on the tablets, uh, the writing of God, it is a great mitzvah to say them, and so wrote the Tur, another famous code of Jewish law, that it is good to recite them, and I say them next to Baruch Shamar at the beginning of the Shachrit service. So we see here, that even though both the Talmud Yerushalmi and the Talmud Bavli decided that we should not recite the Ten Commandments in public because of the heretics who say only they are important, and even though the Rashba agreed with that Talmudic ruling in Barcelona in the 14th century, nonetheless, uh, these important rabbis, Rabbi Yosef Karo, Rabbi Moshe Isilis, Rabbi Shlomo Luria, said that we should recite the Ten Commandments every day, but in private uh, and not in public. And indeed, if you own a very large sidur at home, one of the complete sidurim, such as Avodat Yisrael by Yitzchak Ber from the 19th century, or the Art Scroll sidur uh, from the 20th century, or even the Reform Gates of Prayer from 1975, you will find the Ten Commandments in the prayer book but not as part of the statutory required public prayers. Um, and I conclude my article as follows. It is difficult to choose sides in this debate. On the one hand, the Ten Commandments are very important to Judaism, and it is good for Jews to recite them daily and know them by heart. On the other hand, there is indeed a danger that people will think that there are different levels in the Torah. They might ignore the entire halakhic system and observe only the Ten Commandments. Therefore, it is good that our ancestors only required the reading of the Ten Commandments in public three times a year, but encouraged their recitation in private all year long. In this fashion, we emphasize their importance without turning them into the only important mitzvah. Ad Khan, 
That is the end of my talk about whatever happened to the Ten Commandments. So I hope now you know the answer to my mystery. Uh, and on that note, we will now segue to our second shiur, which is with uh, Dr. Enad Ramon. Uh, Dr. Ramon is a senior lecturer in Jewish thought uh, here at the Schechter Institute. And she is also the founder and director of our wonderful hospital chaplaincy program, CPE program, which is called Marpe, uh, which she founded at Schechter back in 2007, uh, the leading hospital chaplaincy program uh, in the state of Israel, which combines a CPE certificate with an MA degree in Jewish studies. Einat's topic is Professor Max Kedushin's approach to the observance of mitzvot. Einat Bevakasha. Is they not here? <laughs> I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Hi, Yofi, Mitsuya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I even had a chance to listen to your lecture, you know? <laughs> to the diaspora so that I can continue to study with my Halacha teacher and Talmud teacher, so it was an opportunity. Okay, um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm moving to the 20th century and uh, to the conservative movement's heritage in uh, contributing to our understanding of what's halakha and what's, what are the mitzvot and why we do that. And the um, thinker um, which I will focus on is Professor Max Kadushin. I, you know, forgive my, my typos in printing the uh, uh, quotes from his uh, works. Max Kadushin was a um, one, I think, of the major thinkers of the uh, American Jewry in the 20th century. Although he's not very well known, um, he's not as known as Abraham Joshua Heschel, was not as prolific and also not as politically involved and also not as well known as uh, Kaplan. We will see in a moment that he was a Kaplanian and moved away from the reconstructionist position. Um, he uh, was born in Eastern Europe in Minsk and then came to the United States. Later on, he became um, a conservative rabbi. He studied at the um, Jewish Theological Seminary he became a rabbi of congregation in Israel of Washington Heights in New York City, and then um, wrote a book on prayer, and then moved to Chicago, where he was once again a congregational rabbi, and then to Wisconsin, and then eventually he received a DHL at the Jewish Theological Seminary and came back to the seminary to teach at the seminary. Um, vis as a visiting professor in ethics. This is in short, um, Kadushin's a, 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 a professional biography. But let me start with the um, interesting anecdote, which is mentioned at the Wikipedia. Sometimes the Wikipedia has good um, a, articles. Sometimes I think they're a little twisted. Some things are... are um, are uh, uh, accurate, some are less accurate, but here is a very interesting um, fact that we would like to look at. And the fact is that when he was ordained in 1920, he was a disciple of Mordechai Kaplan. But then later on, um, he found himself and began to argue for a more after modernist. I think this is a very interesting um, a term after modernist. This is really the first time that I see that it's not postmodern, but after modern approach. One that placed greater weight on enduring significance of agada. And I here I think the Wikipedia is not accurate enough. Agada and halacha, and the way they're intertwined. Um, and we will look in a second at the terminology. But I want to um, give some uh, thought to the fact that. Initially, was Kedushin was Mordechai Kaplan's um, disciple. And what philosophically is um, interesting about Kaplan is that he um, was very much a modernist. Kaplan believes in progress, in evolution, in the fact that we always progress 
um, and that the ancient world is not uh, relevant to us so much. And therefore we have to reinterpret it in a way that would be relevant to people. And by the way, change it's um, it change the laws, change the theology, change of perceptions. My, um, my uh, professor in my PhD studies at Stanford University, Professor Arnie Eisen, once said um, that uh, Kaplan is really typically a typical um, a reform thinker. And th by then, then I was also a very devout Kaplanian. Um, and uh, I said, what do you mean? How come? You know, he gives a lot of emphasis on tradition and was in many ways a traditional Jew. But the more I explore um, Jewish thought, I see how Kaplan does fit into the category of a reform thinker in a sense that he feels that um, traditional Jews are really not living in line together with contemporary modern culture, you would probably say postmodern culture. And while he really wanted to reconstruct Judaism so it would continue to be a living religion and a living we in a living civilization um, in, in modernity, he really thought many of the ideas were outdated. And that um, I think disturbs many people who take um, Hazal, the rabbis and rabbinic thought very seriously because a lot of what is being said there is very relevant to people today. And in fact, we have to search for the relevance. This, this is really the kind of theology that um, somehow regards tradition in all its forms, in all its ways, as um, vital and, uh, and eternal. And so to say that Kadushin only, we will see in a second how he thought Agadah. Jewish lore, Jewish thought that is embedded in rabbinic stories, in rabbinic sayings about the, the a Bible, um, rabbinic stories in the Talmud, et cetera, are intertwined with um, Jewish law. This, I think, is the contribution of Max Kadushin and not, as the Wikipedia says, Agadah. So here is one comment. The other comment is that I think as he learned more and more and delved into the tradition, he found um, Kaplan's thought um, insufficient in the sense that there was something deeper um, embedded in rabbinic thought that is encapsulated in so many books, uh, uh, the Tanaitic, um, uh, the Tanaitic Midrashim, and as well as um, a, 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 I see here a comment that you should print the sources. I will be happy to do that. To whom should I send the copy? Uh, Michal, should I send it? Yeah, you can send it to me and I'll do it later. That's okay. Okay, I don't have to stop right now and do it? Okay. No, no, no. Go ahead. In any case, um, so the um, rabbinic thought is a very, very rich tradition and, and written tradition. It did all the, you know, the two Talmudim and the, and the, and the uh, Midrashim, Midrashim of the Tanaim, as you know. And so um, to say that in gen generally speaking, this is not a, 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 a just a second, I will, a, I got confused with the um, sharing. To say that this in general is not a, 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 a relevant tradition and that modern, modern um, sens sensibilities um, have to somehow um, a, a defeat the importance of rabbinic tradition that is a kind of reductionist way of looking at, uh, at, at, at all of Judaism because Judaism in general 
even uh, we would say even the non-Orthodox um, traditions in Judaism rely very much on rabbinic thought, and um, uh, and, in, in our, and is being challenged by rabbinic thought in all its richness. And I think Kadushin had um, some kind of a very interesting perception as to how to explain and understand what is rabbinic thought and how it operates. And I will say something about it in a second, but I want you to see his major works are Seder, Theology of Seder and Yahu, and then Organic Thinking, on which we will delve, and then rabbinic mind, the rabbinic mind, worship and ethics, conceptual commentary to the Mechilta. And also there is another book on Leviticus um, uh, Rabbah, on the Midrashic collection of a rabbinic Midrashic collection from the uh, fifth century. So um, in organic thinking in 1938, I want to say that this is quite early because Kaplan's main um, theology, Judaism as a civilization, um, was um, appeared appeared and, and was printed and won a prize in 1935. And so Kadushin uh, already presents an alternative view of Judaism to the one of his teacher three years later. And also we have to remember what had happened in the world during these years, the whole, you know, the Nazis came to rise, the Holocaust is around the corner, Jews already see what's, or see partially what's happening. Um, I think that unfortunately many of them did not see until very, very late, but um, the, uh, you know, the world is in somehow in an upheaval in a 1938 organic thinking appears. And I want to say one more thing, and that is that um, a thinker usually sets the, um, the main um, building blocks of his or her thought in the very, er very early on, and then he or she develop it. And so what Kadushin does later on in his later books, which he wrote 20 years, almost 20 years later, um, in, in the rabbinic mind and then a worship and ethics, um, he developed the ideas that he already had set forth in organic thinking. And we will look at two of the terminologies that are basic to, um, to Kadushin. And I will I hope that you remember them or that you will think about them. I will definitely send the uh, handout and you're most welcome to look at it, teach it, use it, think about it. You're um, a welcome to write to me an email and discuss, continue to discuss these issues uh, on mail with me. I really uh, would love to do that. Um, so <clears throat> the two terms that you um, would like to remember, you know, I learned this from Aleph Bet Yoshua, Israel's main writer, one of one of Israel's main authors that I once heard him speak at Stanford, and he gave a very provocative uh, view of Judaism and the world today. And he, but he said, you know, from everything that I want you that you will hear from me tonight, please remember these two things. So from everything that you will hear with from me in the next fifteen minutes, please remember two. Um, terms. One is um, the term uh, normal mysticism, which we will look at it in a second. And the second thing is organic, um, is um, organic concept that in the end becomes in the later books value concepts. Um, so we will see what they mean. You know, when you look at Jewish thought regarding why is it that we have the commandments? Why is it that we keep the commandments? Why do is it that we pass on the commandments? Why is it that Judaism is a commandment-centered religion? It's commandment-centered civilization, we would say in the Kaplanian term, or commandment-centered people. Um, why is it then many of the which ex explanations are actually not so much in Jewish philosophy, although Maimonides had set forth explanations of 
the different commandments in a, already in medieval times and followed him, a, follow him, a, some other thinkers have followed him, but Kabbalistic tradition is very rich in explaining how each commandment is linked somehow to God, to theology, and why is it therefore important that we would do it? And there we have tremendously rich tradition. But in modernity, the Maimonidean um, paradigm um, expands tremendously. And we could say that most of the contemporary Jewish philosophers are in one way or the other students of, um, of uh, Maimonides. And uh, uh, definitely Kaplan, definitely Mordechai Kaplan, but also Kadushin, although we will see where he also deviates from a very rational Aristotelian Maimonidean thought. And, um, and here is what he says. And so one more um, comment, like Kaplan, Kadushin uh, uh, turns to the social sciences to understand what rabbinic tradition is. And he turns more to anthropology and anthropological ways of looking at, um, at a culture. And there he, he, he recognizes that rabbinic Judaism is a complex experiential values, a complex of experiential values rather than a system of logically consistent truth. Take a look at this term, concept, complex of experiential values, rather than a system of logical consistent truth. So he obviously is not conforming to the philosophical Aristotelian um, method in Judy that was transmitted to Judaism, but he says really what we're doing is that we are living our values through experiences. This is um, uh, why he, he, at first he calls these values organic values and then value concept, a, a organic concepts and then value concepts. Now it is also very important that to, to mention that he sees that all these experiential values that we live are organic. And for, I'm skipping um, the unity of religious behavior is one value. Both find expressions in rabbinic theology. And from the standpoint of organic thinking, there is no contradiction, of course, between the two values. On the one hand, this is organic. And on the other hand, logically consistent truths. The awareness of the unity of religious behavior is nothing other than the recognition that all the details of the Torah are divine. It is the stressing of the concept of the Torah. The awareness of the ethical aspect of life crystallizes itself in the new concepts, as well as soon consider a characteristic method for resolving contradictions in rabbinic theology, we already had occasion to observe. But traces of the awareness of the ethical as such can also be discerned in two tendencies as we shall now describe. Um, I wanna, okay, I wanna, I, I, you know, we don't have the time to look at all the passages, but when, when I will send you the handouts, I may uh, uh, even send a more detailed handout so you could um, delve more deeply into the quote. But it is important that these um, value, these experiential values, these values that we live as experience, and they are complex, and this is an organic system of experiential values, these are actually the mitzvot. Um, the rabbis employ 
uh, inferential reasoning in support of concretizations of the concept of mitzvot. So here is a thing that they concretize the, con the concept of mitzvot. They are giving social and ethical reasons for the observance of the ritualistic mitzvot of tzitzit, filin, and nida, and the Sabbath. Nida is um, the observation of um, a sexual purity. In these examples of logical method, the rabbis demonstrate the reality of a concretization of the concept of the mitzvot, but they do not undertake to prove the existence of the concept in themselves. So you see that Padushin interplays here between the fact that the mitzvot is a logical, ethical, um, concretization of the values, of our Jewish values. We live these values. We don't just talk about them. We don't just discuss them. We discuss them as long as we also live them. And there is something very interesting anthropologically from Kadushin's point of view in the whole organic system of the mitzvot of the philosophy, of the theological terms that they carry, all of these elements in rabbinic Judaism are intertwined into this one big tapestry, which the entire Jewish people is and was aware of and lived this on a daily life. So there is something that Kadushin does here, which I think is very unique. I have not seen it in, a, in that way in, at any of the, um, uh, at any of, of our other major thinkers in modernity, that kind of um, intricate looking into rabbinic um, terminology and seeing how they are all connected to each other, and how each one of them and all of them together are lived as a value. They are a living value. They are a value that we concretize, we concretize, we concretize I'm sorry that for my um, uh, pr pronunciation. The rabbinic experience of God was Normal mysticism, here is a second term, okay? This is one thing is the concretizing the values, the concrete values, the experiential values, organic values, value concept, organic concepts, etc. So this is one thing and, and we are having here a, 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 in, within rabbinic Judaism, all of these concepts slash mitzvot slash theological ideas that are all intertwined add on to a whole daily um, way of living. And what is that way of living? Normal mysticism. This is um, another term that, uh, I think it's me, another term that uh, 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 Kadushin coined. And remember that term. It was a factor in the normal valuational life. Valuational life, life is a life of values. Indeed, rabbinic experience, as we pointed out above, is misnomer. Though it varied in depth as personalities varied, it was the experience of every member of the nation, not alone of such, not alone of such as had special training or temp experimental aptitudes. There was some, there were some individuals, however, whose valuation of life was affected by normal psychological states, such as visions um, and rabbinic theology by no means ex excluded religious experience of that type. He, he says, I think I mistyped here, it is abnormal. Um, in other words, what this passage says is that everybody lived a kind of level of mysticism through observing the mitzvot. They were connected to God. This is a normative and a normal mysticism of Judaism. But so mysticism is not high above. It is not this great vision of the, of the, of the uh, prophets. 
mysticism is something that we live normally by blessing over the tzitzit, by uh, putting on tefillin, by going to the mikveh, by making a blessing over food, you know, all the mitzvot are this great tapestry. However, um, in the Wikipedia, it says that by saying normal mysticism, Kadushin actually went against Kabbalah. This is not true. Look at this passage where he says some individuals, some rabbis, like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, we just celebrated his um, um, eh, 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 his on Lag Baomer, his thought, his bringing to Judaism the you know the book of the Zohar. So yes, there were some individuals whose valuation of life was affected by abnormal psychological states such as visions. And rabbinic theology by no means excluded that, but rabbinic theology does not rely on that. Rabbinic theology is there for everybody, no matter whether they have these um, visions and perhaps mystical connections to God that we ordinary people do not experience. But the ordinary people also live a mystical life through normal mysticism, through the value concepts, through the organic concepts, you see in organic mysticism, we call it organic concept. The process of concretization of the concept is not altogether inevitable, may at times be broken. On such occasions, the individual is made highly aware of the concept that finally determines the situation in question. So Kadushin deals with situations that are of crisis where one value concept does not operate as expected. At times, the rabbi and the people whom they taught were aware of their organic, at all times, the rabbis and the people whom they taught were aware of their organic concepts. And this is also a very central idea that organic thinking, rabbinic organic thinking is a whole culture of the whole people. The rabbis are not in any way superhuman. The prophets in also are not superhuman. Everybody experiences that normal mysticism together. Everybody shares that terminology. That terminology, by the way, Kadushin um, explains, is being taught in every occasion. That's why we have, uh, we learn Torah every day. That's why we learn Torah at every happy occasion at every state of mourning, you know, throughout our life, always. This is an, an opportunity to teach the people that the organic concepts, the value concepts, and how to live normal mysticism and understand why it is that they observe the mitzvot and love the mitzvot, love the commandments, because this is really their way of connecting to each other and to God. So I think I almost made it on time. <laughs> well, Kavod Einat, I hope that we have whet your appetite to study the works of Max Kedushin. Absolutely. I'll send a page and even add a few more passages. The, those of us who studied the JTS in the 1970s used to see him walking around the halls of the seminary with a lot of other great uh, scholars. Uh, and he was known indeed for these two things, uh, value concepts and normal mysticism. And I hope that you will study them because unfortunately, as Enat said, he is not well known today, but he should be. So, I'm even teaching Rabbi, him Inat. on Tikkun El Shavuot in Israel. Well, now I have to translate yep. this. And there, there's a Hebrew synopsis of his works published by Professor right. Robert Holtz about uh, 40 years ago. Unfortunately, the Hebrew edition is, is out of print. But in that Hebrew volume, uh, Professor Holtz summarizes many of the teachings of Professor uh, Kiddushin. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Chag Sameach. Daraba. And now we segue to our third lecture with Rabbi Ari Hasid. Uh, when I sent out the notice, it said that Rabbi Ari Hasid is the assistant director of the Schechter Rabbinical Seminary. I'm happy to say that he has been promoted. Uh, as of July 1st, is the associate dean uh, of the Schechter Rabbinical Seminary. Uh, we're thrilled that he joined our full-time staff uh, in September. Uh, and uh, Rabbi Ari uh, teaches in the rabbinical school, does a lot of the uh, senior administration. Uh, and his topic is Moshe Kibel Torah Misinai, Moses received the Torah at Sinai. What exactly did he receive? Ari Bevakasha. So thank you very much. This actually 
is going to tie in uh, not even only a little bit to what Rav Galinkin taught us about half an hour ago um, about where the Ten Commandments went. I imagine that I'm not the only person here who looked for them in the movie, The Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, but I was wise enough together with Indiana Jones to look away at that point. And so I will continue to search for those important things that were standing in our briefs, but I believe that in fact, uh, it's a big question. What exactly did Moses receive while standing? And what did we receive while standing at Sinai? Um, I, uh, I put in a source sheet that I hope that you'll all be able to open and print. I put it in the chat. It's from the website Svaria. It's a website that I enjoy using very much. Um, and the website, one of the beauties of it is that you can click on any given text and see in Hebrew and English, dozens or sometimes even hundreds of commentaries on the text that we're learning. So if you're not pleased with the way that I'm explaining it, you can look for traditional or other modern commentaries as well on this. So I'd like to share with us a little bit by first starting um, with the beginning of what happens at Mahmad Har Sinai, it's standing at Har Sinai, at Mount Sinai. Um, of course, we are not introduced to Mount Sinai for the first time during the giving of the Ten Commandments. Um, we are introduced to Mount Sinai for the first time during a, another moment. And I admit that I had read this passage so many times, but as it were, that um, even if you go to synagogue every single week, the first time that you see Mount Sinai in the Torah is going to be three weeks before you read about the giving of the Ten Commandments for the Pasha of Yitro. And that is, of course, because as Moses flees um, the Egyptians and goes into Midian and he meets Yitro, he meets Jethro, who has a number of other names. He marries one of his daughters, Tipora, and he goes and he becomes a very successful shepherd. And one day as he is tending to his flock, he ends up at Mount Sinai and that is where he sees the burning bush. Um, and I think that this is uh, not something we talk about very often. The fact that already at Mount Sinai is where that bush is. And then he comes back to it, of course, um, some period later. For the giving of the Torah. So I'd like to share here um, some sources, and you can all also open them on your own and see uh, if you'd like and do that. So I'm going to start here with the famous reading that we're going to be doing. Uh, Rav Lincoln and I, I believe, will be reading it together on Friday morning at the Kotel at 5.30 in the morning. Um, and this is from, of course, from Exodus, and it is, I think, one of the most beautiful, somewhat psychedelic, uh, mystical experiences described in the Torah. All the people witnessed the thunder and lightning. And this is even better in the original Hebrew, the people see the voices. What an amazing metaphor there. The blare of the horn and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they fell back and stood at a, at a distance. You speak to us, they said to Moses, and we will obey, but let not God speak to us, lest we die. Moses answered the people, be not afraid, for God has come only in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may ever be with you so that you do not go astray. So the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. There is a beautiful midrash about that that says that the people heard only the first letter of the first word of the Ten Commandments. The first word of the Ten Commandments is anuchi, which opens with an aleph. But even the aleph without the vowel is what's called in English the glottal stop. And that all of the people standing at Sinai heard only what sounds like a sound. Um, and there's also a real beauty about the Aleph, the Aleph being a letter, which when you can see it, and we can see it right here in the word Asher, for example, the Aleph is one arm reaching toward the sky with a leg falling to the ground, and it is the connection of God in heaven and earth. But it also means that people are hearing different things, and they say to Moses, you get the rest, and we do not want to hear too much. So we know only at that point that um, Moses is up there and the people are at the bottom and that Moses is going to be hearing it directly and not God speaking to the people. Um, we come back to this story in the book of Deuteronomy as, as Moses is telling it again before the entrance into the land of Israel. And he says, the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, another name for Sinai, when the Lord said to me, gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words in order that they may learn to revere me as long as they live on earth, and they so teach their children. You came forward and stood at the foot of the mountain. The mountain, excuse me, was ablaze with flames to the very skies, dark with densest clouds. The Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but perceived no shape, nothing but a voice. He declared to you the covenant that he commanded you to observe, the Ten Commandments. And he inscribed them on two tablets of stone. At the same time, the Lord commanded me to impart to you laws and rules for you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy. 
And here already, just in the text, without going much further into midrashim or commentaries, we can see something that's really interesting, which is that on the one hand, it says that God declared to the people of Israel the Ten Commandments, and this ties into what Rav Golinkin was saying earlier, but that, and Moses put these Ten Commandments on stone. But Moses says, even at this moment, that that's not the only thing that happened. He says, at the same time, the Otitsiva Hashem Ba'etahi, and I received these commandments from God at that exact moment to teach you, to impart to you laws and rules for you to observe in the land that you're about to cross into and occupy. And in that sentence, it implies in the book of Deuteronomy that while God gave the people of Israel the Ten Commandments, God gave Moses all of the instructions about, um, about how to observe these commandments and how to observe rules in general, which is to say, once again, that Moses received something much broader and deeper than just the Ten Commandments. And there's a question in the chat. Can I repeat the description of the letter Aleph? The letter Aleph, and I'm going to show it on our screen here. Um, for example, right here, I'm putting my mouse around the Aleph here. You can see it sort of has two arms in the air and it has two feet on the ground. Um, I am uh, dressed appropriately, but I'm not going to show the zoom to my legs. But you can see, you know, that the Aleph is both reaching toward the sky, perhaps reaching toward the heavens of God, and is also going down to earth and connecting us to earth. I learned a beautiful lesson from my friend um, and uh, teacher, Eliana Seltzer, who taught me once that, um, in fact, it is also like the experience of parenthood is very much like this. Well, on the one hand, as parents going to synagogue, we might be reaching for holiness in the sky. And on the other hand, there is a child tugging at us, at our legs and at our arms, and that we always have to understand that the holiness of parenting is at the same time that we are not disconnecting from our children, but that we are at the same time embracing our children with one arm and embracing holiness and otherworldliness with the other. I want us to move a little bit further down Jewish history from the Tanakh itself, from the biblical passages that I've read to us, to some Talmudic passages where they discuss exactly what happened. Um, and I'm looking, and I'm going to bring a few of them, we'll go into a few in a little bit of greater detail. And the big question that's being asked is, what did Moses receive at Mount Sinai? Because in the book of Exodus, it seems pretty clear that what Moses received in that great moment of what we call Ma'amad Har Sinai was the Ten Commandments. And then the book of Exodus continues with what we read in Parashat Mishpatim and Parashat Truma and Tetzaveh and Kitisa and all of this is happening. And then we go back and we see that the golden calf is happening. And we're not really sure what is going on. And what and, you know, we don't know. And because there's no, no early or late in the Torah, we don't know exactly what the order of everything is. Um, and of course, we also don't know when is the book of Vayikra, when is the book of Leviticus given, when is the book of Numbers given. Um, so maybe it's just the Ten Commandments. On the other hand, um, as Rabbi Golinkin taught us earlier, you know, it would be these minim, these heretics, who said that God only gave Moses the Ten Commandments, where we know that the rest of the Torah was also received there. Um, we're going to see just how expansive that idea is. Um, and here we have a disagreement between two wonderful Tanaim, two very learned rabbis of the second century, um, of the period that comprises what becomes the laws of the Mishnah after the destruction of the temple. And this is recorded in the Babylonian Talmud. And it says, Rabbi Yishmael says, and he says this in an old source, a source that is outside of the Mishnah, but is from the Mishnahic period. Rabbi Yishmael says, general statements were said at Sinai. Um, and we have the help of uh, the editor who says, that is, Moses received general mitzvot at Sinai, including the Ten Commandments. But he just says, Klalot ne'emru b'Sinai, General statements were said at Sinai, and the details of the needs float were explained to Moses at a later time in the Ohel Moed and the Tent of Meeting. So already we have an idea that the basis happens at Mount Sinai, but that the expansion of laws has to happen somewhere else. Rabbi Yishmael tends to have a slightly more literal reading of the Torah, not quite as liberal, for example, as Shammai, the elder from a period much earlier. But nevertheless, Rabbi Yishmael does not have quite as a expansive a reading as Rabbi Akiva does. Rabbi Akiva says, on the other hand, both general statements and the details of mitzvot were said at Sinai and later repeated in the tent of meeting and reiterated a third time by Moses to the Jewish people in the plains of Moab and the book of Deuteronomy before they enter into the land of Israel. So Rabbi Akiva holds that God gives the entire Torah 
to Moses on Mount Sinai during that period. But what they both agree with, of course, is that all of the mitzvot and all of the Torah is godly, but there is a question of what exactly happens when. And they also do something very interesting, which is to say that it is possible to give Torah first in general precepts and only later to go into the details. And then those two things can be an ongoing process, according to Rabbi Yishmael and Rabbi Akiva, seems to believe that it happens all at once. And we're going to come back to that Rabbi Akiva a little bit later. Um, as we see that also when we repeat, um, we know, of course, that the Ten Commandments are given twice in the Torah. One, um, they're, they're given once, but it's described twice, once in Exodus and once in Deuteronomy. But also after the golden calf incident, Moses goes back and is told to once again get commandments. Um, and the sharp reader will notice that those commands are not identical to what they were a few chapters earlier. And we read here in Exodus 24, the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the stone tablets with the teaching and commandments, which I have inscribed to instruct them. So again, we have this idea that maybe what happens at Mount Sinai is the Ten Commandments, um, and maybe it is something broader. Um, and we have a little midrash on that from the Talmudic tractate of Brachot. Rabbi Levi Bar Chama said that Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, we've heard his name earlier today in terms of his uh, his his year at site, which was observed on Lag Omer. God said to Moses, ascend to me in the mountain and be there and I will give you the stone tablets in the Torah and the mitzvah that I've written that you may teach them. Meaning that God revealed to Moses not only the written Torah, but all of Torah as it would be transmitted through the generations. And here we understand that the question is not only was Moses the recipient of the Ten Commandments or the written Torah, but rather did Moses receive both the written Torah and the oral Torah on Mount Sinai, right? Both the words that go on to become our rabbinic teachings, as well as the words of the five books of Moses. And here we have an expansion going on. We're familiar with this type of midrash in which they first make a general statement and then they go one by one explaining it from the Passover Seder, where we have this in different ways where they argue about 50 or 250 and how many plagues are at the sea. The, ten, the tablets are the Ten Commandments that were written on the tablets of the covenant. An easy one. The Torah is the five books of Moses. The mitzvah, and here we have an expansion, is the Mishnah, which includes explanations for the mitzvot and how they are to be performed. Of course, the Mishnah is not verse by verse explanations. That's what call, we call a midrash. The Mishnah is the collection of laws, generally does not have, with a few, ex a few exceptions, does not have a list of verses, but rather just a list of laws. That I have written refers to the prophets and writings written with divine inspiration. No claim that God told these words directly to the people, but rather divine inspiration. That you may teach them refers to the Talmud, which explains the Mishnah. These explanations are the foundations for the ruling of practical halakha. This verse teaches that all aspects of the Torah were given to Moses from Sinai. So in fact, even when Rav Galinkin writes a responsum that goes out on email, according to this midrash in the Talmud, that was already given to Moses at Sinai because of all the foundations for how to explain the law through the generations. Um, and that is what Rabbi Levi Bar Chama is teaching in the name of Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish. And it is perhaps interesting, maybe that's something that Rabbi Shimon Lakish picked up during his years in the cave studying mystical teachings, or it could be something that he learned from his teacher, Rabbi Akiva. Um, and this brings us to something really interesting, a Mishnah that many of us might be familiar with, and that it is the opening words of Pirkei Avot. Um, as we are about to come to the close of the period between Passover and Shavuot, there are many Jewish communities around us who have spent the last... Um, Last night, we counted 45 days learning Pirkei Avot, especially on Shabbat morning in some communities or Shabbat afternoon in some communities. And it opens like this. Moshe received the Torah from Sinai and transmitted it to Yeshua, to Joshua, and Joshua to the elders and the elders to the prophets, and the prophets transmitted it to the men of the great assembly. Um, the word Anashim in Hebrew is people, but it is probably more historically accurate um, that it was men, although there were women prophets, for example, that are described in the Tanakh, uh, very notably Dvora or Chulda, who had a very important role in keeping the Torah alive during the period of Josiah. Um, and what the Mishnah and Pirkei Avot is teaching us is that the Torah has been given from generation to generation. And after it describes the people of the Great Assembly, they don't have particular names um, in the Pirkei Avot, but some of the people attributed to the people of the Great Assembly include Mordechai of the Purim story, or Ezra and Nehemiah, for example. 
Um, they go on and they keep teaching it over the generations until it makes it to a list of people called the Zugot, the couples, the pairs. Um, and they teach in pairs until it goes on to the early rabbis of the period after the Torah. Um, and when we say that Moses received Torah from Sinai and then it goes to Mishnaic teachings, it seems clear that they may be talking about the written Torah, but they are certainly also talking about the oral Torah. Um, and it shows that in this Mishnah, it is clear that they believe that what Moses received at Mount Sinai was not only the five books of Moses, but also a much more expansive idea of the oral Torah that they themselves are teaching. Um, and I learned, for example, from my teacher, um, Moshe Benevitz, whose name has also come up today, I believe that, um, and he's one of our instructors at the Schechter Institutes, that, for example, you know, our Jewish tradition teaches that anybody who bears the name rabbi, as opposed to rav, but rabbi, in Hebrew, is somebody who received the smicha ordination, which means that they actually received that oral tradition of Torah from generation to generation, as opposed to a mere teacher like myself, who did not receive the oral Torah directly from Moses, but rather instead received the ability to teach the texts that came before me. So that could be maybe one of these discussions is what exactly happened and was there an oral Torah that was complete versus um, commentaries that came later. I want to go back to what we said about Rabbi Akiva earlier. Rabbi Akiva has said in one of the earlier texts that we listened to that Moses received everything at Mount Sinai. And we're going to see in a very famous and very difficult story about that, just how the Talmud understands what Rabbi Akiva was saying. And this is in the Babylonian Talmud in Menachot, which discusses, among other things, the laws of Torah scrolls and mezuzot and tefillin. We have Rabbi Yehuda, who is an early post mishnaic rabbi in Amura, who teaches the name of Rav, saying, when Moses ascended on high, he found the Holy One, blessed be he, sitting and tying crowns on the letters of the Torah. Moses said before God, Master of the universe, Ribbono Sholam, who is preventing you from giving the Torah without these additions? Moses is thinking to himself, God, I'm here for 40 days. I'd like to get the Torah a little faster. Why are you spending time with these, what we call ketarim, these little crowns on the letters? Anyone who has seen a Torah scroll from up close will know that the letters are very fancy calligraphy and they have crowns on many of the letters. God said to Moses, there is a man who is destined to be born after several generations and Akiva, son of Yosef is his name. He is destined to derive from each and every thorn of these crowns, mounds upon mounds of halachot. Right? Every little thing on an extra letter is going to be significant to Rabbi Akiva. Moses is curious about this. It is for his sake that the crowns must be added to letters of Torah. Moses said before God, Master of the universe, show him to me. God said to him, return behind you. A very strange kind of phrase in the Hebrew there where Moses kind of turns around and finds himself in a different world in a different time. Moses went and sat at the end of the eighth row in Rabbi Akiva's study hall and did not understand what they were saying. A pedagogically interesting choice of the Beitei Midrash of that time is that the most excellent students would sit in the front row and the students who were the furthest behind would sit the furthest behind. Um, I'm glad that my daughter's elementary school does not hold to that way of thinking, but that was what was happening. And the text is telling us that Moses is a poor student. He did not understand. Moses' strength waned as he thought his Torah knowledge was deficient. What a strange story. Moses is in the middle of receiving the Torah, and he goes to Rabbi Akiva's Beit Midrash, and he doesn't understand any of the teachings of the Torah. And this is a very difficult moment for him. When Rabbi Akiva arrived at a discussion of one matter, his students said to him, my teacher, from where do you derive this? And Rabbi Akiva said to them, it is a halakha transmitted to Moses from Sinai. R Rabbi Akiva does is he learns these texts from, and he learns from all these little flourishes on the letters, but he attributes it to Moses because the letters and the tradition of writing letters goes back all the way to Moses. And we've, as we've learned, Rabbi Akiva believes that Moses received the entire Torah at Sinai. When Moses heard this, his mind was put at ease as this too was part of the Torah that he was to receive. Now. I feel like it's inappropriate to end this teaching, even though this is the point I want to make. It's inappropriate to end the teaching without the rest of the story. The rest of the story is that Moses is curious as to, first of all, why God chose to give the Torah to Moses and not Rabbi Akiva, because Rabbi Akiva is so brilliant. And then later on, 
he wants to know how Rabbi Akiva is rewarded by God. And of course, the reward is not a reward at all, but is a very, very painful and terrible death that he dies at the hands of the Romans. And one of the answers that the Torah, that this Talmudic passage gives us is that we can never understand how God works in this world. But what I want to say about this, is, which is so fascinating, is that there is something deep in this text which says that Moses receives at Mount Sinai in the Torah, the tools that allow him to understand, that allow other people to understand what becomes the oral Torah, which is not that God sits with Moses and says to him, Amar Rabbi Akiva, Amar Rabbi Ishmael. He doesn't go through and give him the words per se of all of the Mishnah, but rather God gives within the Torah all of the abilities to understand deeper levels from generation to generation. Um, and it reminds me of a midrash, which is found in different places. And I did not bring it here. Um, I don't have a copy of it in English, but it teaches that a king gives flax and wheat to two of his sons and asks them to hold on to it very nicely. And he goes to check in a period of time later to see who did something nicer with the flax and the wheat. And one son shows him the flax as it is and the wheat as it is. And the other one has a beautifully weaved tablecloth with chalot on the table. And it says, which is better, the flax and the wheat having not been touched or the bread and the tablecloth? And what it teaches us is that everything is there, even if Moses received only the flax and the wheat at Mount Sinai, the Jewish people have had the ability to turn that flax and wheat into this beautiful Judaism that we live today. Um, that means that we received all of it on Mount Sinai, even if we did the work of the cooking and the weaving. And I also believe that it says that it's not necessarily clear that all of us will understand every secret of Torah in every generation, but that does not mean that there is not a holiness that is in it, and that the new chidushim, the new ways of looking at the Torah, are not just as ancient as the words themselves. Um, and I want to end with one of the most famous Talmudic passages. It is taught in Israeli Batei Midrash in every stream of Judaism. I believe that anybody of any stream, whether you are secular or ultra-Orthodox or Orthodox conservative reform or traditional can say, this proves that our brand of Judaism is the right brand of Judaism. Um, and I just think that that teaches the truth of this. And it is called Achnai's Oven. Um, Achnai's oven, I first learned actually when I was a high school student coming to Israel with USY um, some numbers of years ago, and we went to the Talmudic village in Katsrin, and there was a video about Achnai's oven, and there was actually an oven in this video, uh, excuse me, an oven in this Talmudic village, I recommend going, although I admit that it took me many, many years of learning it until um, my teacher, Rabbi Joel Levy, with whom I went to synagogue at Mayanot in Jerusalem, in a Dvar Torah one Shabbat, explained it to me in a way that was really um, eye-opening. And so I give him a lot of credit and thanks for what is written here in the text, but I had never learned before. We learned in a Mishnah in the Masechet of Kelim, and it is talking about an oven. If one cut an earthenware oven widthwise into segments and placed sand between each and every segment, Rabbi Eliezer deems it ritually pure, which is to say, Rabbi Eliezer says that it cannot be made ritually impure is perhaps the, this is a good translation, but the explanation is that it cannot become impure. And the unbold text says this very clearly. Because of the sand, its legal status is not that of a complete vessel, and therefore it is not susceptible to ritual impurity. Because what we don't abide by many laws of purity and impurity today, but when you're making a new vessel, only when it is complete can it even receive impurity. Um, and so what Rabbi Eliezer is saying is that because there is sand between each and every segment, on the one hand, you could say it's incomplete because it's not one material, or you could also say that you can add more sand and add another segment in the future, and therefore it's not complete because it can be built upon. Therefore, it cannot be made impure. And the rabbis deem it richly impure as it is functionally a complete oven. This is very, 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 very sharp. Um, so. And so um, what we're saying here is that the big question is if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, but it is not completed yet, is it a duck? And the rabbis say, as long as you can put food inside of it and a fire underneath and the food comes out cooked, it is an oven, whether or not it is not complete in the sense that it can be made bigger later on. 
Um, and therefore, it can be made ritually impure. And they call this the oven of Achnai. And I'm going to go on. Um, Rabbi, Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda said that Shemuel said, um, and they talk about the snakes. The sages taught. On that day, when they discussed this matter, Rabbi Eliezer answered all possible answers in the world to support his opinion, but the rabbis did not accept his explanations from him. And what goes on is a beautiful, magical story um, in which Rabbi Eliezer, in fact, does not give any answers to his opinion whatsoever, but instead uses miracles to try to explain why he is correct and the rabbis are wrong. After um, It says here, after failing to convince the rabbis, logically, I'm not sure that the text actually says that, um, but what it does say in bold, Rabbi Yezer said to them, if the halakha is in accordance with my opinion, this carob tree will prove it. The carob tree was uprooted from its place 100 cubits, and there are others who say 400 cubits. And the rabbi said to him, one does not cite halachic proof from the carob tree. Rabbi Yezer said to them, if the halakha is in accordance with my opinion, the stream will prove it. The water in the stream or the aqueduct turned backward and began flowing in the opposite direction. Again, two miracles that are supernatural. And the rabbi, and they said to him, one does not cite halakhic proof from a stream. Rabbi Elazar said to them, if the halakha is in accordance with my opinion, the walls of the study hall will prove it. The walls of the hall leaned inward and began to fall. Rabbi Yeshua scolded the walls and said to them, if taller scholars are contending with each other in manners of halakha, what is the nature of your involvement in this dispute? Why would you, you know, there's no point to a building to learn Torah if we're going to use supernatural ways to solve our issues. The walls did not fall because of deference due to Rabbi Yeshua, but they did not straighten back up because of deference due to Rabbi Eliezer, and they still remained leaning. Rabbi Eliezer said to them, if the halacha is according to my opinion, heaven will prove it. A divine voice emerged from heaven and said, why are you fighting with Rabbi Eliezer as the halacha is in his opinion? In every place, he is never, ever wrong. Why fight with him? And Rabbi Yeshua, who is a very, very, very big man and one who did not get up very easily, stood on his feet and said, lo bashamayim he, and he quotes the book of Deuteronomy and says, it is not in heaven. Or in other words, he says, hakadosh baruch Hu, you butt out. We don't need to hear your opinion anymore. What is the relevance of this phrase, the Gemara asks, because we use it even in modern Hebrew to mean it's doable, it's possible. And the Torah says, you know, it's something we can achieve. But Rabbi Yirmiyah explains Rabbi Yoshua and says, since the Torah was already given at Mount Sinai, we do not regard, we do not heed a divine voice. As it is already written in the Mount Sinai and the Torah, you go after the majority, that we follow the opinions of majority. And since the majority of rabbis disagreed with Rabbi Yazar's opinion, the halacha is not ruled in accordance with his opinion. The Gemara relates years afterward, Rabbi Natan is in heaven and meets Elijah the prophet and says to him, what did the Holy One, blessed be he, do at this time during this dispute? And Elijah says to him, God looked at them and smiled and said, my children have triumphed over me. My children have triumphed over me. Um, and it's 8.30, so I would like to wrap up about what they're saying. I believe that what Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Eliezer is saying is that the Torah was given in one way only, and any discussion that the rabbis have after that is a discussion, but God had an intention, and we should fulfill that intention, and we shouldn't come up with anything new. Because the oven is one complete oven. And the rabbis are saying, in fact, the Torah is a series of links with sand and more links. And what we received at Sinai is itself that oven, and it served its purpose at that time, and it will serve its purpose in our time, and it will serve its purpose in the generations to come. And in every generation, we add links because we have already received a Torah that gives us that opportunity to have links, and we will always keep the fire going in that Torah. And even though Moses received the Torah in that time, by giving us the opportunity to continue to build links, all of that is the same Torah in the same oven. So I'd like to wish everybody a Chag Sameach, and again, I would be happy to uh, continue these conversations in Jerusalem on Zoom over email. Um, and thank you again to uh, everybody and to Michal for running this and to Rav Lincoln for inviting me. Thank you very much, Rabbi Ari. I just want to say one thing about this Faria translation here about the water aqueduct. It says the stream flew backwards, but the Hebrew says amatamayim. A water aqueduct cannot flow backwards because it is based on gravity. <laughs> That is why Herod's water aqueduct goes from all the way from Hebron to Jerusalem, this incredible architectural feat of 2,000 years ago, and somehow the water ended up in the temple. 
So it's it's a much more powerful translation if you say the water aqueduct flew back uh, flew backwards because that's totally impossible, uh, and that is of course one of the points of this story. These miraculous events proving uh, the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer. Uh, I want to thank my co-teachers, uh, Dr. Inat Ramon, Rabbi Ari Hasid, Michal, who's running the Zoom now, Josh Schumann, who planned the Zoom. Uh, if any of you happen to be in Jerusalem for Shavuot, we're having a Tikkun Lel Shavuot at the Schechter Institute at 10 p.m. Uh, in Hebrew, uh, behind the Israel Museum. And if you're in Jerusalem and you want to take a nice walk, you can meet us at 5 a.m. at the Kotel Masorti at Robinson's Arch. Uh, Rabbi Ari and I, God willing, will be there together with Rabbi Nava Bernstein, our graduate who's at the Agron Street uh, Synagogue. We'll be running services there at 5 a.m. on Shavuot morning. For those of you in the diaspora, I wish you a, a very a joyous uh, Shavuot, two days of Shavuot. Um, and as you listen to the Ten Commandments being read, you can remember some of the things you learned this evening. Todah and Chag Sameach.